Hi, this is AMK. This is part 11 of my Ben Wall series videos. We're going to look at the autopsies today, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking. We're just going to get right to it. So let's go. Okay, so for this part to start, we're going to refer back to the handy dandy little note paper that I drew up listing the investigators that were there at the crime scene. And we did go through all of them except for Detective Shelton. And we will get to that, but the reason I'm showing you this is because when we went through these supplemental summaries in, I think it was part six, the one with A, B, C, D, all of those parts, when we looked at Lieutenant Powell's report, there was a part that I skipped because that was the part of his summary where he was describing what he saw when he was there to witness the autopsies. So we're going to go back to Lieutenant Trey Powell's supplemental, and we're going to take a look at that today. And then we're going to go back to Detective Harper's report. Um, in the first few parts, we looked at his initial walkthrough of the crime scene, and there's a section of his report where he summarizes the autopsy reports. So we'll take a look at that also. And then we're going to look at the autopsy reports. But one thing you should know as we go into this, I do not have the autopsy report for Daniel. And I'll explain why when I get to the autopsies. So just keep in mind, as I read through the investigator supplementals, that will be the only detail we have regarding the autopsy for Daniel. So I'm sorry, I know it sucks that I can't get that document, but we have these investigator supplementals to look through. And I also have the death certificates that we can can look at and some other forms that the family had to sign like to release the bodies and I'm gonna show you all of that hopefully I can get it all in one video but I won't be able to if I don't shut up and start looking at the at the material here so we are going to start with like I said Lieutenant Powell as witness to the autopsies so I'll see you there okay so what we're looking at here this is Lieutenant Powell's report. It doesn't have a date here, which really bothers me, but it says right here on June 26th, 2007. And oh shit, um, I think I also should say that I'm also going to be referencing some pretty gruesome terms. I will leave a link to Carrie the Mortician's YouTube channel. She does a really excellent job of very briefly and succinctly explaining what these terms mean without making it graphic. I will try to show a slide explaining briefly or at least with the definition of the terminology but just a warning we are going to be talking about an autopsy here of three people one of them a seven-year-old child so please be aware this could be very sensitive and we are going to talk about some pretty graphic things in this one so viewer discretion is advised okay this one's gonna be tough to get through so let's do this on June 26, 2007. So they this was the day they did the autopsies. And if you recall, it was the 25th where they did the welfare check and they found the crime scene. And it was that day that they moved the bodies to be transported to the crime lab which is where the autopsies took place. And that's also where Dr. Chris Sperry, as the medical examiner, gets involved, which I mentioned his involvement with the Kendrick Johnson case. But Dr. Sperry, he comes into play when we look at the toxicology reports. So that's where that gets a little interesting there. But for now, we're focusing on this. So let's get through this. So on June 26, 2007, Deputy Sheriff Russell and Lieutenant Trey Powell, who is I in this summary, they arrived at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to view the autopsies of Daniel Benoit, Chris Benoit, and Nancy Benoit. We arrived at approximately 0900 hours, which was 9 o'clock a.m., and received badges from the front desk of the operations area to gain access to the medical examiner's area. Once in the medical examiner's office, we were allowed inside the examination room where the autopsies would take place. At approximately 0930 hours, hours, 9.30 a.m., the process began with the body of Daniel Benoit. The face still showing signs of petechia even after the body had been transported to the lab. We noted at the scene that the boy looked asleep at the time of his death. 
His exterior of his body looked normal with only a mark on his left arm. It looked like a puncture mark, but it was undetermined at the time. And this is important to note what is said here because remember, we don't have Daniel's autopsy report to verify this. And as you'll soon see, this paragraph is kind of, well, I think it's important. I'll explain why in a bit, but for now, keep in mind, this report says Daniel had a mark that looked like a puncture mark, but it says that it was undetermined at the time. Let's see what else it says. The body showed signs of lividity at the scene before the body had been removed. And once the clothes had been removed, the stomach area of the body showed slight signs of early decomposition with a green color showing through the skin. We also noted there was a mark on his scalp when the skin was pulled off of the skull. I could not see any markings on the skull itself. The doctor noted that it was a cervical compression of the neck. And this was Daniel Benoit, okay? So he noted at the scene that he looked asleep at the time of his death. The exterior of his body was normal, but he had a mark on his left arm that could be a puncture mark, but was undetermined. And there was a mark on his scalp, but yet then they say it was a cervical compression of the neck. That doesn't make sense to me, but I'm not a coroner or a medical examiner, of course. So we'll see if we can't get more information on this as we look further into these documents. So let's keep reading. At approximately 1145 hours, 1145 a.m., we began to view the body of Chris Benoit. The blood that was noted on his nose at the scene. Oh shit, here we go okay, had been removed by the moisture of the body or rubbed off in the bag. Now, if you watched my previous videos, specifically part five with the search warrant, we saw that at the crime scene, they saw the blood on Benoit's nose and on a finger, but they didn't take a sample of the blood because it was their experience to transport the body as is to the crime lab. But by the time the body got to the crime lab, the blood was gone. So they couldn't take a sample of this blood. That's a problem to me. But let's see what Lieutenant Powell's report says about that now. The blood splatter noted on his left index finger showed no signs of injury either. So this is strange. It said in the police report, remember, I'll put a screenshot here, that the blood that was on his finger was also gone when it got to the crime lab. So now it's saying here the blood splatter noted on his left index finger showed no signs of injury either. I just find that wording confusing because, because it sounds like they're saying that the blood splatter could still be seen at the crime lab. But then it goes on to say, I noted no marking of injury where the blood smear was on his nose. Okay, but then it goes back to talking about the blood spatter on his finger. So was the blood on his finger visible during the autopsy or not? Because if it wasn't there, then how could they possibly determine this next part where they say, I noted no marking or injury where the blood smear was on his nose. The blood was noted to be spatter and most likely produced by another source. The source likely being his wife, Nancy Benoit. Now, see, I feel like this is a big stretch here because even if you could see the blood, likely isn't evidence. It's, it's not. And then um, at the scene, I noted lividity in his chest, stomach, and legs, and the body was somewhat stiff, but he did not seem to have rigor mortis. His body was not limp at the time of transport. There was nothing else remarkable about this subject. What, really? Nothing else. Nothing else at all. Not any other thing that's noteworthy. Nothing wrong around his neck? But they say Daniel had cervical compression of the neck. But according to Lieutenant Powell, who witnessed the autopsy, in his report right here, Benoit just had blood splatter on his left index finger that they're saying this is what Lieutenant Powell's observations or notes from viewing the autopsy, this is what he is noting. 
it's he's saying here Daniel has cervical compression to the neck but that Chris Benoit I mean it doesn't say anything it just talks about the blood splatter most likely produced by another source likely being the wife and then there's nothing else remarkable about this subject so anyway let's see what else it says here at approximately 1400 hours which would be two o'clock p.m we began to view the body of nancy benoit i noted at the scene that nancy's body showed signs of decomposition in her face and body after we removed the blanket that was covering her her face and upper arms looked to be in the advanced decomposition stage with her skin starting to slip and oh my gosh, guys, please take my word for it. Do not look up what that means. Do not look that up. You will not get that image out of your head. I'm just saying, if you want to know more about these pathology terms, the safest place to look is the playlist of two-minute videos on Carrie the Mortician's YouTube channel. The link to that playlist is below. And while you're down there, hit that like button and subscribe. Thank you. Now let's finish this report. I also noted some insect activity and her skin starting to bubble up. The pool of blood at her face seemed to be coming from her mouth or nose, but we could not determine any injuries at the time. I also noted green discoloration in her stomach area. At the autopsy after the clothing was removed, I noted that most of her body was in advanced decomposition with green discoloration covering most of her body. I also noted that her skin was slipping from her torso, arms, and legs. There were several areas of bruising on her legs and her neck area. The blood had been determined to have come from her mouth. With the odor and discoloration of her skin, it would seem that she had been dead for a longer period of time than Daniel or Chris Benoit. But again, for probably the thousandth time I'm saying it, it was warmer in that room where Nancy was found. It was 82 degrees. In the room where Daniel was found, they noted that it was 72 degrees. That's a 10 degree difference. And we're not talking 10 degree difference from 50 to 60 degrees, which might not make that much of a difference, but we're talking 82 degrees. And then I would think being in a basement that the weight room would be cooler, maybe deliberately designed to be cooler being a weight room area, so I just feel like maybe those temperatures had something to do with these stages of decomposition. But um, then there's another piece down here. And uh, it just, he, for whatever reason, wanted to note that during the autopsy of Nancy Benoit, as the rope and cable were removed from her neck, an egg mass was noted under the victim's hair at the right shoulder. My goodness. But then this goes on then to another supplemental report that we already went over. So now we're going to jump back up in the report, further up in these pages, and look at Detective Harper's summary of the autopsy based on him reading the information and his interpretation of what the autopsy report says. So I'll see you there. All right, this is in Detective Harper's report, and this is the section of the report where he details his interpretation of the autopsy report. Uh, Dr. Eisenstadt is the medical examiner who did the autopsy at the crime lab. And Dr. Eisenstadt is still, to this day, at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's crime lab. And today, he's the chief medical examiner, which at the time of these Benoit murders, it was Dr. Chris Sperry who had the position of chief medical examiner. But he resigned in disgrace. I'll talk more about that when we do the toxicology report, so subscribe so you don't miss out. And for now, we are going to start here with the autopsy. On Monday, August 27th, 2007. Now, remember, the autopsy took place on June 26th. So that was the day after the bodies were found. So on Monday, August 27th, 2007, the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, or GBI, crime lab released the autopsy results for the Benoit family. Detective Harper downloaded and printed the reports for review. And autopsy reports are almost always public record. Almost always. In certain cases, they're not. 
like specifically for juveniles, which is one of the reasons why I had trouble with getting Daniel's autopsy report. Because believe me, I tried. But Chris and Nancy's, they are both publicly available for anybody to look at, and um, links to them both are in the description box below. And the website where these are linked to, if you go to the homepage, they have a whole lot of celebrities' autopsy reports. You can pick one, you can search, and you can look at them. But anyway, let's look at what Detective Harper made of the autopsy report. And the autopsy reports were prepared by Dr. Jonathan Eisenstadt. The report for Nancy Benoit showed her cause of death as strangulation. The report also showed her manner of death as a homicide, ligature strangulation. And most of the injuries they describe for Nancy are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to do much explaining for this. I'm just going to read it. Dr. Eisenstadt noted the post-mortem changes present at the beginning of Nancy Benoit's autopsy. Dr. Eisenstadt explained there were marked changes from decomposition, which including a foul odor and green discoloration on the face, torso, arms, and thighs. Dr. Eisenstadt noted the green discoloration on the arms only extended to the wrists where ligatures were tied and was not present on the hands. Oh my, fly eggs were noted in the right axilla, and that's the armpit. The report detailed several internal and external injuries to the body of Nancy Benoit. Dr. Eisenstadt noted the quarter-inch wide horizontal furrow that surrounded Nancy Benoit's entire neckline. Dr. Eisenstadt described the two ligatures, rope, cord, and coaxial cable around Nancy Benoit's neck. Dr. Eisenstadt described how the rope was looped twice around Nancy's neck and tied on the back side of the neck. It was also described how the coaxial cable was looped once around the neck and intertwined with the rope. One end of the coaxial cable extended down the left side of Nancy's back, while the other end of the coaxial cable extended down the right side of Nancy's back. Dr. Eisenstadt described how the two ends of the coaxial cable were tied around Nancy's left wrist and right palm with a knot in between both hands and noted the ligature compression marks on both wrists and Nancy's right palm. Dr. Eisenstadt described the S-video cable wrapped three times around both of Nancy's wrists and knotted on the left wrist, causing ligature furrows on both wrists. Dr. Eisenstadt also described the black tape and small electrical cord wrapped three times around Nancy Benoit's ankles. The report also described several other injuries. Dr. Eisenstadt commented on the following. A focal hemorrhage was noted in the right side of the tongue. Keep in mind, in these reports, when they say the right side of the tongue, that would mean Nancy Benoit's right side. Areas of hemorrhage were observed throughout the soft tissue of the upper chest and lower neck, as well as hemorrhage within the thyroid gland. A hemorrhage was located in the soft tissue of the lower portion of the back of Nancy Benoit's neck and the upper portion of her back. A marked hemorrhage was found in the right side subscalpular below the scalp soft tissue, but no skull fractures were found. Dr. Eisenstadt noted multiple contusions or bruising on Nancy Benoit's legs, knees, and buttock. It was also noted that areas of green discoloration on the right buttock and left leg made it impossible to determine if the areas were injuries or post-mortem changes. In the remaining portions of the autopsy report, Dr. Eisenstadt comments that Nancy Benoit's body systems and organs are normal or unremarkable. The report concludes with Dr. Eisenstadt's opinion that Nancy Benoit died as a result of ligature strangulation with evidence of blunt impact injuries to the head and lower extremities. Dr. Eisenstadt's opinion also remarked about the hemorrhage in the soft tissue of Nancy Benoit's upper back and mid-chest 
advising the injury was consistent with some form of blunt impact or applied pressure to either the back or to the chest. Dr. Eisenstadt also comments on the previously released toxicology report and ends his opinion stating Nancy Benoit's manner of death is homicide. And the toxicology report is what we're going to look at after I finish going through the autopsy stuff. So we're getting there. Okay, so now we're getting to Daniel's autopsy. And there's a lot to get into with this here. But you'll see that there's all of a sudden no mention of the needle mark that Lieutenant Powell mentioned in his report from when he witnessed the autopsy. So let's see what this says. The autopsy report for Daniel Benoit showed the cause of death as cervical compression and the manner of death as homicide. Dr. Eisenstadt initially commented on the postmortem changes. Dr. Eisenstadt noted the presence of the discoloration associated, I think that it should be with lividity, on the body of Daniel Benoit. Dr. Eisenstadt also remarked about the presence of tardive spots along with petechiae on Daniel Benoit's chest. These spots are consistent with the cause of death. The report also notes the early decompositional changes, namely the green discoloration found along Daniel Benoit's abdomen and mummification of the tip of Daniel's fingers. What? How did he get mummified fingers? Well, I did a little digging on that and mummification occurs in hot, dry environments when the body dehydrates and bacteria is at a minimum. And according to this article from Science Direct, extensive mummification can occur indoors within three weeks, especially if the person is emaciated. And it says here that it's not that rare. And emaciation, or when somebody is emaciated, it means they're extremely skinny, usually from disease or hunger. So looking into these things, I only looked as far as what I needed to for the purpose of this video, but I did find a lot of things looking through here that I need to dig further in, as you're about to see. Next, Dr. Eisenstadt commented on internal and external injuries to the body of Daniel Benoit. Externally, Dr. Eisenstadt located several small abrasions on Daniel's knees, legs, forearms, and elbows. Now, I'm not trying to make excuses here, but he's a little boy. Little boys get bumps, and especially on these areas from climbing, playing. Dr. Eisenstadt noted there was no external evidence of trauma to Daniel Benoit's neck. Dr. Eisenstadt did find petechiae on Daniel's forehead, nasal bridge, lower lip, eyelids, and in both eyes, which is consistent with the stated cause of death. It was noted that no fractures were present within the cervical vertebrae, hyoid bone, or thyroid cartilage, but a focal hemorrhage was observed within the left sternohyoid muscle of the neck. During an examination of Daniel's head, Dr. Eisenstadt located a small area of discoloration on Daniel's right jawline at the angle of the mandible. A focal hemorrhage was also found in the subscapular soft tissue of the left side of Daniel's forehead. No skull or facial bone fractures were located. This is about to get really detailed and really interesting, so make sure you click that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. A slight hemorrhage was located within the leptomeninges of the brainstem. This area is an outer covering of the central nervous system. During an examination of the internal organs of Daniel Benoit, it was noted that Dr. Eisenstadt found moderate congestion, slight intraalveolar hemorrhage, and minimal peribronchiolar nonspecific chronic inflammation during an examination of the lungs. Now, I did some research on what those terms mean, and I found some interesting things. So this particular paragraph here, everything mentioned here has to do with the examination of the lungs. So intraalveolar hemorrhage, the hemorrhage part, of course, indicates there was bleeding. And alveolar refers to the alveoli, which are the tiny sacs in the lung that hold air. So the presence of hemorrhaging here could be an indication of suffocation or strangulation or asphyxiation. But then I found this article on the National Institute of Health's website. And this is going to give away a big part of my theory as to what I think happened 
but it clearly says here in this article that intraalveolar hemorrhage is a very common finding in the very young due to attempts at resuscitation. And it even goes on to say it is neither a necessary nor a specific marker of deliberate or accidental suffocation. And this information was published in May of 2018. So if this is a new finding, then they wouldn't have been aware of this in 2007. And I think it's also important to point out that this is regarding SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, and Early Childhood. Daniel was born February 25th of the year 2000, so he was seven years old at the time of his death, but only four months into his seventh year, so I feel like it's still worth considering. And as always, all links to these articles are in the description box below, but let's keep going here. An examination of the liver found rare clusters of intralobular chronic inflammatory cells and apoptotic cells. And note that it says these were rare clusters. And apoptotic cells, apoptosis is cell death. It was also noted that the pancreas was markedly autolyzed. Now, with that, when they say it was markedly autolyzed, that means it was really autolyzed. And autolysis is the disintegration of cells by endogenous enzymes, basically the self-digestion of the pancreas. And what are endogenous enzymes? Endogenous antigens are generated from inside the body, okay? And what is an antigen? Well, an antigen is any substance that's capable under certain conditions to induce a specific immune response. So this finding wouldn't have been caused by anything related to his death as far as a homicide. But that's what I think, not what I know. I'm not an expert. So digging into this a little further, I found something that's going to knock your socks off. Are you ready? It turns out there's this thing called autoimmune pancreatitis. And that is an autoimmune disorder that is thought to be called by the immune system attacking the pancreas. And guess what? This autoimmune disorder responds to steroid therapy. Boom! I mean, holy shit. I was just, I was like, oh my god. What if Daniel didn't have Fragile X? What if he had this pancreatic immune dis autoimmune disorder and they were treating him with steroids? I mean, it connects some dots. I'm not trying to be medical examiner here. Obviously, I have no way of knowing this, and I'm nowhere near close to licensed to make this assessment. I could be completely wrong about this. This is not a diagnosis by any means. Please keep that in mind. But, oh my god. And then it says, as far as Daniel, the remaining observations were listed as normal or unremarkable. And unfortunately, as far as Daniel's autopsy, this is as much as we're going to get, because like I already said, I don't have Daniel's actual autopsy report. Okay. At the conclusion of his report... Oh, notice though, there's no mention of the puncture mark on the left arm that Lieutenant Powell noted in his report when he witnessed the autopsy. So that's where I think the conspiracy-minded people come in with saying, first there were needle marks, then there's not. Did he have Fragile X? Did he not? I'm doing research into what all of this means because it sounds like these things that are going on in Daniel's liver and his pancreas, I'm not sure if all of that would have happened with death or if that was something already going on prior to death and whether Nancy and Chris were even aware of it or not. You know what I mean? Was it undiagnosed? Or did they know about it and they were treating him with steroids? It's so unfortunate we'll probably never know the answers to any of this. Let's go on here. At the conclusion of his report, Dr. Eisenstadt wrote his opinion as to his findings. Dr. Eisenstadt commented that Daniel Benoit died as a result of compression of his neck, which resulted in asphyxia. Dr. Eisenstadt stated that hemorrhage was found in a muscle within the neck and petechiae on the face and eyes. The findings were consistent with the compression of the cervical region of the neck. And now this next part also kind of gives away my theory of what I think may have happened. Maybe I should have done the toxicology report before this, but I'm planning on doing that immediately after finishing the autopsy report, so that's what's coming next. Dr. Eisenstadt commented on the previously released toxicology report stating a significant level of alprazolam, which is Xanax, was revealed during testing, but it was not the underlying cause of death. The manner of death was restated as homicide. 
and you can see that the investigators did find a lot of alprazolam and other prescription drugs in the home, and you can see that in part five of my series about the search warrant. As always, all links are below. But this is what's interesting. When you see what that toxicology report says, it contradict. in my opinion, it contradicts this report right here. And keep in mind that what I'm reading from right now is not the autopsy report. This is Detective Harper's summarization of what he is reading from the autopsy report. This is another reason conspiracy-minded people are drawn to this case. There are a lot of nuances and just plain inconsistencies that we've never gotten an explanation for. I'm not even trying to be conspiracy-minded as I'm digging through this. I'm just following where the research leads me. And this is where the corruption at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation's crime lab comes into consideration because we have some conflicting reports here and it just seems like details get a bit muddy the higher up we go on the ladder of authority. You know, it seems to be the ones with the most authority are the ones fogging up the windows, so to speak. And the most powerful and influential people, which would in this case, I believe, be the people at the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. I mean, don't forget, the blood they found on Benoit disappeared somewhere during transport from the home to the crime lab. So, dear Susan Wojcicki and YouTube algorithms, we're just playing like a game of Clue to figure out, you know, who did it in what room and with what object. So, please don't delete my channel for asking questions. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, if you know, you know. So let's keep reading here. Dr. Eisenstadt also performed the autopsy on Chris Benoit. Dr. Eisenstadt commented that Chris Benoit's cause of death was hanging and the manner of death was suicide. And I apologize for my voice. I am just getting over a cold. I'm doing the best I can here. I feel like every time I put a video out, I have some sort of, oh, poor me excuse. Like, please help me buy paper. Please. Um, I'm sorry I was depressed. I'm sorry I had trouble with space and saving the video. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm a mess and I admit it. I'm not afraid to. But I'm sorry. I'm making jokes and this is a very serious, very serious subject. So, apologies. Okay, I will focus on reading this. During an examination of Chris Benoit's body, Dr. Eisenstadt noted slight abrasions on both of Chris Benoit's legs, left foot, left arm and hand and right hand. Dr. Eisenstadt described the looped black rope from the weight machine located around Chris Benoit's neck, as well as the torn white towel that was wrapped around Chris Benoit's neck and taped together. Oh, it was taped together? This is new. It was taped together. What is this now? We're all of a sudden hearing the towel was taped together. And I'll put a screenshot here of the investigators' supplemental reports. Did they mention anything about the cloth being taped together? Well, as you can plainly see, here's Detective Harper's report where he mentions the piece of white cloth. And here, further down on the same page, Harper mentions the cloth again, but nothing about tape. And here, Deputy Sheriff Rojas, in his report, mentions the cloth, but no tape. And here, Deputy Sheriff Russell's report mentions a white hand towel. Still no tape. And here's Lieutenant Powell's report. He also mentions the towel, but no tape. And here, further down in Lieutenant Powell's report, when he witnessed the cord around Benoit's neck being cut so the body could be moved to the crime lab, there's mention of white cloth. But still, guess what? No tape. That's four different investigators who saw this towel but didn't notice any tape holding pieces of it together. And you can see every word of all of those investigators' supplementals in all the different parts to part six of my series. Links below. I mean, what the fuck? So far, we have missing blood, needle marks appearing and disappearing, and a cloth that magically taped itself together somewhere between the time the bodies left the crime scene and arrived at the GBI crime lab. Are you following this? What the hell? And then, to add insult to injury here, pardon the pun, 
They expect us to seriously believe that, on top of the already complicated way they describe this suicide, see Part Four, the crime scene, for more details on that. But then they tell us not only did he tear a white cloth to put between his neck and the cable from the weight machine, but he took the time to tape it together. <laughs> and <laughs> what is this shit? Again, oh, I'm so sorry. I should not be making jokes. All right, we're almost through this report, so I'm gonna focus. Let's get through this. Dr. Eisenstadt commented on the ligature furrow that completely surrounded Chris Benoit's neck. It was noted that the furrow was horizontal across the front of the neck and elevated upwards toward the back of the neck. The report noted a few scattered petechial hemorrhages in both eyes. While examining the internal organs, Dr. Eisenstadt commented that the heart appeared enlarged. The lungs had some congestion and inflammation. The liver had some congestion. The adrenal gland had slight autolytic change, and the testes had some amount of atrophy. In Dr. Eisenstadt's opinion, Chris Benoit died as a result of hanging himself. Dr. Eisenstadt noted that the lack of significant trauma, along with the furrow around Chris Benoit's neck, supports the manner of death as a suicide. Dr. Eisenstadt also commented on the previously released toxicology report concerning the blood level of alprazolam and hydrocodone, advising these results were in the therapeutic range. Now, I've got to say something. This here, the results were in the therapeutic range. This is why I commented in of my earlier videos, like way back in part one or two, there were no drugs in Benoit's system because I saw on the toxicology report that levels of medications were in the therapeutic range. And in my experience, from working at a residential inpatient drug and alcohol rehab facility, if you are prescribed a medication and it's in your blood at a therapeutic level, that doesn't indicate that there's a high enough level of the drug to give you like an intoxicating effect from it. One thing I, I need to look into more about this is I'm not sure what is considered therapeutic range. And what I mean by that is how do they calculate what should be considered therapeutic? I thought that therapeutic range meant, you know, the standard for your weight and height. What the amount should be based on what the doctor has prescribed for you. So I read therapeutic levels and thought, okay, so they were taking the meds as prescribed, so all good here, nothing to see. But then I saw all the medications and the incredible amount that they were prescribed. I mean, and you can see in part five the amount of these prescriptions that were found in the home. And I can't see any way possible that that would be considered therapeutic in their blood unless they were selling them and only taking, you know, what they thought they needed, which I did consider a possibility. But then I had to consider what if they were taking all of the pills? Since they were prescribed such a high formulation of the drugs, and if they were taking that many, then I have to wonder, would the prescribed amount be what is considered therapeutic range? To me, that doesn't make a lot of sense because then a doctor can prescribe whatever without any oversight and claim, well, it's in the therapeutic range. And the amount the Benoit's were prescribed and how often they were getting the prescription refilled, I don't care how big you are, there's no way that's a therapeutic amount. So either I'm wrong about my understanding of therapeutic levels, which is probably the most likely, or they were taking a couple here and there and selling the pills, which would have kept them in a therapeutic range, or they are straight up lying at the crime lab and measuring the therapeutic levels based on the amount the doctor had been over-prescribing, and we know damn well he was over-prescribing. You can see what happened to the Benoit's doctor in part 5b. And is that what was done in this instance to make it appear that they didn't have high levels of these drugs in their blood. And I can also tell you from experience of working with these types of medications, if somebody's taking the amount of pills that was indicated in part five with the search warrant, the dates that they got the prescriptions and how many pills were left in the bottle and how many pills they were prescribed, if they were taking that amount of pills with that high of a formulation, they wouldn't have been able to have like 
a normal life, people would notice. They would be sleeping all the time. Unless they had been taking that much for so long that it just took that much for them to feel normal, which is considered a functioning addiction, but still an addiction nonetheless because it all breaks down in your body as morphine.、Uh, it really doesn't matter which of these formulations you take. So, yeah, I hope I explained that semi clearly. <laughs> If I'm wrong, or if anyone has anything to add, please feel free to comment. I know I have a few psychologists and social workers watching. Please correct me if I'm wrong, because this has me seriously scratching my head. And that's something that I, I want to look into. And I also noticed that they didn't mention anything about these drugs in the summary up here for Nancy's toxicology report. They noted it about Daniel, and they're noting it here about Chris Benoit. But notice they just want to kind of keep it quiet about Nancy having just as much of a problem, if not more. I mean, they mentioned the tox report. I'll put a screenshot here so you can see side by side. But it's like an afterthought, and no specific medications are mentioned. Find that interesting and, and troublesome. And I'm sorry if it seems like I'm picking on Nancy. Nancy was a strong and a strong willed woman. I don't really think that she would have allowed anyone to hurt Daniel or any, any of them without a fight. I, I don't know. But I do know I really need to get through this. Yeah, last time I seriously didn't think I was going to get it uploaded. And I'm still just talking and talking and talking. And I keep saying I need to stop. Okay, so finally, Dr. Eisenstadt commented on the elevated level of testosterone in Chris Benoit's urine, coupled with the elevated testosterone to epitestosterone ratio, signified an exogenous. Or outside source of testosterone.、And、what that basically means is you naturally have testosterone in your body, but in Chris Benoit's case, instead of a normal level of testosterone, that it was an elevated amount, that it signifies that there was extra testosterone coming from an outside source. So they're insinuating he was injecting testosterone. However, again, when we look closer at these toxicology reports, you're going to see that this summary here doesn't exactly explain it correctly.、Um, but then, as you can see, it goes on to the brain study. So I might have to end this here and do what I did before, where like I upload it as two parts, but I'd put them on at the same time so you don't have to wait. I'm really running out. I mean, it's getting. I used to have 10 gigabytes of space to work with, and I don't understand why it tells me I have 10 gigabytes of free space, but when I try to save the video, it tells me I need to have 7 gigabytes of space or something, and only 5 is available, so I have to delete shit. But anyway. If I wouldn't tell you that in every single video, maybe I could get one uploaded really easily.、Um, holy shit, I'm a mess. So I'm going to end this right now, and in the next video, we'll look at the actual autopsy reports. And if you like what I do and you would like to support my research, a link to my Cash App is below in the description box. I do this for free. I'm not earning any money from YouTube for this, so any little bit goes a long way. As always, thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. This has been Amk. Bye.